This is Generation Green's Wildflower Project, the podcast that starts conversations to create connections on this journey we're all doing called life. Together, we can grow through what we go through and bloom in spite of it all. So let's be like wildflowers and see where the wind blows us. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Generation Green's Wildflower Project. I'm your host, Sherry Sobey, and I'm here today with uh, Natalie Dode. Is that correct, Natalie? Yes, you said it right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Who uh, has, well, you are a social worker and a femme instructor. We're going to get her to explain this. But her, I guess your business name is called the Fertility Awareness Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So first, let's get you to explain what a femme instructor is and what the Fertility Awareness Project is is all about. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Um, So FEM is a program that stands for Fertility Education and Medical Management. So I was inspired to take this course because I was personally looking for an alternative to hormonal birth control. So I searched high and low for for options that were kind of outside of the mainstream and what were normally offered as women to manage our fertility, basically, um, and avoid pregnancy. So I came across uh, the Fertility Awareness Method, which is FAM for short. And basically what it is, is it teaches women and menstruators, people who have ovaries and a uterus but might not identify as a woman as well, um, to understand how their reproductive health works and how that influences their fertility. So oftentimes we We manage our contraception and we manage our fertility, but we don't really understand how it works. And there is a group of people, there's a movement happening where people are starting to understand their bodies a little bit more. So that's kind of what FEM encompasses. And it encompasses learning about your hormones and learning about your fertility um, and just basically learning about your cycles, your, your menstrual cycles and your fertility cycles. And this isn't just about, you know, contraception um, or trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. It is actually to for overall health too, correct? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of women find it in different ways. So some women find FAM through trying to conceive and that's how we have normally heard about it in the past and more and more women are using it to avoid pregnancy. But as well, the whole like side benefit of FAM is learning about your body. And sometimes we have health issues or reproductive health issues and this just helps us to understand the root causes of that and to really just feel empowered in our own health. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you, when you get to know your body that well, you are also going to kind of become familiar with the cycle, obviously, but also the the hormones and how you might be behaving or reacting mm-hmm. and that, oh, there's a reason for this, right? For I'm sure. kind of right in the middle. So I I think that like I've always thought, okay, you take a temperature. I think they called it the basal temperature mm-hmm, method. Yeah. That was one way. Yeah. Or is that still the way? Yeah. And now, and then there's, I guess, another way as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, basically how it works generally is you take your basal body temperature and then you also track your cervical fluid. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women might not actually be familiar with this or what it does, but it actually is essential in understanding where we are hormonally in our cycle. So our basal body temperature is our lowest body temperature attained during rest. And what it does is it tells us if we've ovulated. Um, So that still happens. People still track that. And then there's also other signs that you can track as well to tell you where you are in your cycle. But it's definitely really interesting because we don't really realize what's going on outside of menstruation. So we're often really aware that we're bleeding because it's a physical thing that happens. But there's a lot going on under the surface that we might not necessarily be aware of. And so that's something that I really try to teach women about is what's going on through your entire cycle outside of just the five to seven days that you're bleeding and to really understand that and see how kind of your moods are affected or your motivation is affected or your creativity. There's a lot of different things that are kind of influenced through your cycle that you can start to pay attention to. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So for overall health, okay, if you're trying to track that, like, can it pick up like on maybe a potential illness? Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. So there's different things that we can pay attention to in our cycles that will tell us about about our health. Um, and nowadays we're starting to talk a lot about our thyroid health, our hormonal health, um, 
other illnesses that might crop up that we might not necessarily have been aware of until we start charting our cycle. Things like endometriosis and um, infertility can also be linked to the health of our cycle, obviously. Um, And we can start to track that and monitor it. And we can also see how implementing different lifestyle changes can show up in our charts and our in our cycles and start to pay attention to that as well. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I also read something on your website about you can be cooking uh, and eating basically for your cycle too. Mm, How does that work? Sure, yeah. (laughs) So basically it's the idea that um, our nutrition, what we eat affects our overall health, right? And we can eat certain things that that impact our menstrual cycle as well. So from a hormonal perspective, uh, during when we're bleeding, we can eat foods that are higher in iron to replenish the iron that we've lost. And But we're leading up to uh, menstruation. We can also eat foods that can ease uh, PMS as well. So different foods with different um, nutrients and minerals can help us ease some of the symptoms that we might have in our cycle. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, I know a a kabillion women that would love to know about what could be helping prevent some of the the perimenopausal For symptoms. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely our hormones are a lifelong thing and right. and things that can crop up earlier, crop up later can be mitigated with um, nutrition and lifestyle and just more awareness of what's going on um, with our own bodies for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think that we ever really get to learn enough. Like we learn the basics in school, right? Mm-hmm. We know the parts and all that and, and sort of the parts actually. I don't know if we learn all of them. But we don't learn this. And then you see so many young girls that start having severe cramping or they're maybe they're having acne issues and then or they're not regular periods. And then right away, they the doctors are giving them birth control. So mm-hmm. these synthetic hormones that are basically doing what? Band-aiding yeah. a problem. Correct? Yeah. What are some of the other problems that start to creep up once you've done that? For sure. I think, yeah, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. There's so many young girls and young women who are on the birth control pill for non-contraceptive related reasons. So you have heavy periods, you have bad acne, you have cramps or painful periods, and you go to your doctor and usually what they, the first thing they'll do is they'll prescribe you the pill. And I think we'll look back uh, at this time and and kind of shake our heads and wonder why we weren't offered more as women to deal with some of the issues that we're seeing. And yeah, it's definitely a band-aid solution because I get a lot of messages from women now who are in their late 20s and their 30s and they're trying to conceive, but they've been on the pill for 10 or 15 years and suddenly they come off and their periods are nowhere to be found or they have um, trouble ovulating or they have just like the issues that they went on the pill for have come back Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really sad to see and it's really sad to hear because women aren't told that when they're put on Mm -hmm. um, that that could potentially happen that it could take a while for their fertility to return or that the issues that they went on the pill for might still be there when they go off more than mm-hmm. likely they still will. Exactly. Yeah. So it is it's really sad to see because we're not being really told the whole story. Yeah. 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 Um and I know personally, I mean, I couldn't take the birth control pill because it made me physically ill. Mm-hmm. And um so just looked for other alternatives and and of course was never told about anything like this that I could actually chart <laughs> um and learn a bit more through and I wonder why that is so that there the doctors don't explain that why Yeah, it's such a great question. It's something we talk a lot about in the workshop that I teach on natural birth control. It's like, if this is so great and if this works, like, why aren't we told about it? Or why don't more people talk about it? And I think that's the feeling that a lot of people get when they learn it is that why didn't I know this sooner? And why wasn't I told the whole story? And I think there's a lot of different factors that contribute to that. But I think doctors don't really aren't educated or trained in Mm -hmm. how women's fertility works. So they kind of know like the basics, but once you go a little bit deeper, they might not actually know that this is an option and that it works and that women can learn it. And I think we also just live in a culture where we value quick fixes and we want things to just kind of happen. 
and definitely with fertility awareness you need to learn about how your body works and you need to kind of just really integrate the knowledge into you your own being and your own life and I think people kind of shy away from that a little bit because it's just it requires a little bit more work on the outset for sure right yeah because this is like a daily charting exactly uh, experience right Mm -hmm. like you yeah you have to be are you doing both or one or the other so you are paying attention to two main things every day which is your basal body temperature and your cervical fluid or your cervical mucus And at first, it definitely feels like a tedious habit for some people. Like any habit, you have to kind of get used to paying attention to something that you've never noticed before. But once you kind of start doing it every day, it just becomes something that you don't you don't necessarily notice or you notice it, but it doesn't feel like work to notice it It kind of just happens. But um, yeah, you're basically charting it on you know, a lot of people chart now on apps, which is really cool. So well, there's tons of different apps that you can chart with um, and record this information on. You can also chart on paper, which is a lot of a lot of people learn to chart on paper. And I prefer doing that just because it keeps me off my phone a little bit more. But yeah, it's a, it's a daily practice and you have to you have to really stick with it to um, get the hang of it for sure. Right. And mm-hmm. well, and for it to be working for you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you skip a day there, it's the same thing as skipping a day with uh, with the other things, right? Um, with the other methods. And for people that are, you know, have these root cause issues that they mandated and went off of them, w- if they start taking on this type of a routine, uh, do things start to change for them? Like, yeah, that's a really, that's a really interesting question. I think, like anything, once you start observing it, funny things start to happen. So when I started charting my cycles, my I had kind of regular cycles my whole life. Um, and my first ch- cycle that I started charting was, I think, 175 days long. So it was just like a really long cycle. I wasn't ovulating. I wasn't getting my period. And I couldn't figure out why this was happening. Nothing really had changed other than I just started paying attention to my cycles. And it was really just like my body and my cycles asking me to start paying attention to what was going on. Um, and I think that happens for a lot of women. So either they they just get an overwhelming sense of of responsibility and ownership over their own bodies and their own cycles or their own health. Um, and that can show up in a lot of different ways. But definitely a lot of insights come out once we start charting and we start paying attention to how long our cycles are, um, whether we're ovulating every month, um, whether our um, menstrual menstrual bleeds are, are healthy and normal, whether we experience a lot of PMS. Those are all things that can tell us about our health and about our hormones as well. Right. Mm-hmm. And definitely, yeah, I know with the um, the symptoms that we can experience, whether it is during menstruation or um, for perimenopausal, a lot of those can be traced back to the thyroid Mm -hmm. and our adrenal glands. And if we're not keeping those supported and healthy, then we definitely are going to have more symptoms or stronger symptoms Mm -hmm. than other people. And so I'm, I'm wondering, like, with young girls that are going on, like, for skin issues where is that coming from like why like is there not something else they can be doing I mean what that it's obviously something hormonal yeah Yeah. do you know what it is (laughs) yeah no I think I don't know I guess like there's not one answer for that it can be a lot of different things but they do say they whoever they is the researchers (laughs) the researchers say that issues that crop up in um teenagers who are just getting their periods can be a sign of hormonal imbalance right off the bat. And also teenagers who are just starting to bleed will notice often um, more irregularities or more um, imbalances right off the bat because their their cycles are just kind of trying to figure themselves out. Mm -hmm. So things like acne can be really annoying for a young girl once you go on the pill the way that your testosterone is being suppressed, the, the acne goes right away. Um, but it, again, isn't, it, it's not dealing with the root cause of the issue, which could be 
um, a food intolerance, a, a gut imbalance. Like it could be so many different things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it can be really tempting to go on the pill and yeah, and see well, those especially go away. yeah, because you want that, like you mm-hmm. said, you want that instant yeah. kind of fix, and that's pretty involved, and especially for a teenager, I know. But I really do think the more that we get in touch with our bodies and get to know our bodies, it's going to serve us throughout the rest of our life too. So if it is something that's spoken about, and actually in my last podcast, I was interviewing Alison Ritchie. And, you know, when we talked about just trying to create this, this, it, that this is a, an amazing thing that's happening within us, you know, just to even connect with that. And, you know, just getting the knowledge, I suppose, eh? Mm-hmm. I think a big one, though, and I think you can probably agree with this one, because I even saw you put something on your website about that, about what we put on our bodies is going into our bodies. So I think we're we're putting, we're not so aware. So when you have these young teenage girls that have these symptoms, well, from birth until that moment, what kind of products have you been using, right? There's a big one with so many synthetic hormones in those products. So this is one I'm pretty passionate about for sure. And the reason why I started this and where I started in all of, uh, in with Generation Green. And uh, so talk about uh, what you know about that. Mm-hmm. I love talking about this one too. <laughs> and I also, um, yeah, when I was trying to sort out my own cycles and my own hormones, I was kind of clearing out or taking a look at what I was eating and taking a look at uh, what I was putting in my body. And I, I'm i really grateful to have grown up in a family that valued um, non-toxic living and organic stuff. And, and this was something that I always took for granted until I realized that what I was putting on my body using as my personal care products was affecting my cycles because a lot of those parabens those phthalates those fragrances are all mimicking estrogen in our bodies and um yeah they've done they've done studies on on young girls who use those products and after three days their bp levels um in their urine or in their blood samples go down like an incredible amount so we can we can see like the actual effects that these products are having on the plastic levels in our in our bodies which is wild to me um and young girls are using these products a lot more Um, oh yeah just look at the like cosmetics exactly yeah Uh. and we're told that we're not good enough for that we we need to use these products and they're really really toxic and a lot of countries are banning them too and yet we're not really told about the dangers of them we kind of have to do our own research um and so yeah I've definitely (laughs) gone like I've definitely started making my own products and looking into alternative cosmetics and I found um I can't really go back now to what I used to use because now I'm just so like used to it or sensitive to the fragrances or I don't know what it is but we kind of just become sensitized to or desensitized to the effects of those products. It's It's totally true. It's totally true because I cannot handle, I know right away if it's a synthetic fragrance, right away. And I can't even walk into certain stores like in a mall because that fragrance is so strong. I don't know if my sense of smell even cleared up. Maybe that's it because like people say, I have a nose like a hound dog, okay? I can smell stuff everywhere. But chemical fragrance, I instantly get a headache. So I know what what it is. And that was the number one thing that I started telling people when you're looking at products, look there first, okay? If that word fragrance is on there, well, it's comprised of like, com- you know, so many chemicals in there. And so that's a huge one. And it's a really easy one to start paying attention to. Um, definitely when you're starting out anyways, right? Because it is overwhelming. It is overwhelming, but there's options. And that's what's so great. Whether you're making it yourself and there's like a hundred million recipes online, So there's really no excuses here. And I mean, as far as the cosmetics now, I mean, there's been such headway on that too. And one of my very favorites, of course, that I am so proud to carry here is Piranata's line, which is made in Morta, Manitoba. And, you know, I think... also because I, I built a relation with this company knowing that they they have the same kind of thinking about there's no reason for us to compromise our health for beauty or for cosmetics or whatever you want to say with it. Um, there is no reason because there are alternatives. And just as you were saying about the amount of products that 
do have these and why are they on the shelf? When you look at Europe and their standards, right? And how many chemicals do they have banned that, I mean, Canada's catching up slowly. I mean, we're at least better than our friends over in the, uh, next door here. Um, but it's true, like it's it's unreasonable that these things are in there. It's just not necessary and we're compromising our health for it. And I think it's terrible. I think mm-hmm. it's terrible. Yeah. Because you do, you feel that. And if you were to really be that tuned into your body, you would notice other things, I think, as well mm-hmm. from it. For um, sure. Yeah. And it's around us so, so much without us really being able to avoid it that if we can start with our own homes and our own bathrooms that can be a huge uh that can that can be huge just to start with taking a look at some of those products that we use to clean with or we use for makeup or in the shower and that in of itself is like amazing yeah Yeah, it can make such a big difference yeah Yeah. and it starts to snowball too exactly right because it's so easy once Mm -hmm. you start making some changes you make some small ones and then it just keeps growing and growing all on its own but I think you'll even start to see it once you give that up, it's like the, that I think I've heard people say when they stop smoking, how they their sense of taste is so much better. And so you are so much more uh, intuitive into how your body is reacting, I think, to those products when you put them on your body or have around your body or like even, you know, you're sleeping, right? What is your bedding made of? And yeah. I mean, there's yeah. like... It's huge, obviously, and we can go a little bit crazy trying to think about it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, all those things really do, like how our house was built even, really is influencing, um, you know, our hormones and our bodies. So like what you said, the more that we can take control, where we can take control, the better, because hopefully we can counteract it or, or, you know, kind of get some kind of balance there happening, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's not so saturated with chemicals and and what have you so it's it's terrible it's just terrible um one of the other things uh i wanted to talk about was where you say we should be friends with our hormones Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) Yeah. they're not bad right (laughs) they're not our enemies yeah for sure yeah i um i was doing a talk or like a workshop at a high school about a month ago and how i brought this up with the grade nines that i was talking about was um, has anybody has anybody said you're so hormonal or have you heard that that term you're so hormonal that's not a bad thing we actually are hormonal beings we have hormones and we often see the negative side of those in hormonal imbalances or troubles with our cycles or moods and really understanding what they are and how they work is foundational in learning fam um, and it can be really empowering to understand um, what the different hormones are how they impact how you feel um, how they ebb and flow and how we as women also ebb and flow and and we rhythm with nature as well which is really really cool so um, that's one thing that I really appreciate about fam is a lot of women aren't taught this about their bodies and they're not taught about their hormones um, and at all stages of our life we can we can understand what impact they have in our own lives and um, really dig deep into that. And just there's so much to learn once you start and um, which is really exciting if you're if you're into that kind of thing. And everything you do, your everything you do in your life, the products you use, the foods you eat, your environment, the people you're with all influence your hormones and your hormones influence the processes in your body. Um, so you can really understand your body that way which I think is really cool. (laughs) And a lot of women, once they learn that, are really blown away. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, Yeah. and I think, yeah, and it just serves you for the rest of the time once you do even go, you know, when whether you're going through pregnancy and postpartum, Mm -hmm. uh, perimenopause, menopause, all of those. It's just preparing you. The more you know sooner, Mm -hmm. right, the more you just kind of can move with it a lot easier, I think. Because a lot of it is shocking along the way if you haven't, you know, been prepared, or you haven't, you know, understood what's going on for you at certain times. And I like what you say, too, about, you know, the ebb and flow with nature, too, because I don't think we pay attention to that either. And seasonally, that we are affected. And I, I 
really like to even see something with the with the moon cycles, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because I'm sure that is greatly affecting. Oh, for as well. sure. Yeah, we definitely are influenced by the moon cycles. And once you start charting your cycle, you can kind of see how the moon um, is influencing your cycle as well. Whether you're bleeding with the new moon or the full moon, and ovulating with the new moon or the full moon, um, and even if you're not if you're not menstruating, you can still align with the moon phases and you can still kind of see how your own energy is influenced by the moon phases as well. Um, but for sure, and like going back to the hormone thing too, like it, the reason it's so empowering for a lot of people is because oftentimes when you go to the doctor with a, a health issue or hormonal issue or um, menstrual health issue, it can be really disempowering to not know what's going on. And when you go with that information and you're able to really advocate for your own health and advocate for what's going on, that can be huge and that can be really empowering because um, a lot of doctors might not know what the root causes of of what you're experiencing are and you might actually have more insights um, because of, of what you know about your own cycle, which can be really cool. Well, it's true. Mm-hmm. And it's like what you said, too. Like, I mean, with a GP doctor, they are learning the basics. So they they know a little bit about everything. And I guess if you were to go see a, a gynecologist or an obstetrician, they would probably know, obviously, they've made that their specialty. So they're going to be to know that. But a lot of times you're not going to see a gynecologist obstetrician until, uh, obviously, you're trying to conceive or you have conceived, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because that is just not how it works. No. No, not at all. You get a GP. That's about it. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm huge about being your own healthcare advocate because it was, I think, because I did know my body. I And maybe it was because I didn't take synthetic birth control. I'm not sure. But I could, I knew when things were starting to change, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I really didn't learn any of this, I did know something was, was happening or what was happening to a certain extent anyways. And it was when I... I would have this pain on the left side of my body and it was con- like it was every month and my doctor when I went to him he said oh that's just ovulating pain and I said I don't feel like it is I think wouldn't it be you know going to the other side like it's only he goes you're probably mistaken it's probably on it's moving back and forth and you're just not being aware and it was only after I think where I said you know, I know something is really wrong here. And I was bleeding really, really heavy every month, like to the point that I was becoming anemic. And I mean, I've already had three children. And it seemed to get worse every time I had a child as well. So it was then that I had said, you know what, I, I, I'm i going to just do what I can do here. And I'm going to have a uterine ablation. That's what I think might help after I did some research. And it was after that that they found because they have to do a biopsy during that time, and found that I had this really rare tumor in the lining of my uterus. That was pretty large, actually. So I knew there was something wrong in my body. I would, like, and if we listen to our instincts like that too, uh, we don't we don't give ourselves enough credit for the information that you know our body like what it's telling us, right? Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't insisted, like, who knows, you know, how worse this would have, you know, gone. Um, so I really do think that this is huge for that, for healthcare um, advocacy, because we do know ourselves uh, better than anybody. And um, I mean, we can worry about a lot of things too, but at least this way, I think, you know, it would definitely help us to know when something was really wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are you teaching, you're teaching classes on this? Right. Mm -hmm. And what's involved with those and how do people get into one of your classes? How often? Yeah. So I originally started Fertility Awareness Project to reach out to the Winnipeg community because I felt like this was a huge piece of information and learning that um, I wanted to share with other people who were interested. And um, so I kind of just stumbled, (laughs) stumbled along, figuring things out as I went. And as I kind of started my own online business, I I realized that there were people all over who um, are part of this community who want, who either wanted to know more or who were huge advocates of um, empowering women to learn about their own bodies. So 
I so I do a large part of of my teaching online through online group classes and currently I'm teaching a group of women in Winnipeg as well so I'm kind of bridging two worlds and teaching in person as well as online and then also just doing a lot of outreach and education around um, menstrual health and women's health and yeah it's a it's a huge passion of mine and having the online space to do that is really really cool um as you know probably from the people you've connected with through instagram or um selling stuff online we can really reach a lot more people and we can we can really share um our passions with with more people and and meet other people who have the the same interests or the same passions i guess Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's a safe way to do it too Mm -hmm. right maybe not everybody's comfortable coming into a group setting yeah so i I like the idea of having that option because or or they're just not able to even get into to drive to a certain place or what have you but and i think the safety thing especially for those that maybe don't identify right as as female uh for them to be able to um get a little bit more knowledge and a little Mm -hmm. bit more understanding and so where did the passion come from, though, for like within you? Yeah, no, I don't know. Like initially it was kind of that experience of just like utter, like just being taken aback that that I didn't know that I even ovulated every month, that I was a woman, that this happened and I didn't know. And it just felt so important to me to be able to um, to share this with other people who are interested and to understand that there are alternatives to hormonal birth control or what we kind of uh, view as normal. And I think so many people um, are under the impression that they have to be on hormonal birth control if they're responsible sexual humans. Um, So I don't know, my experience and the experience of people who are around me is that you have to be taking something or you have to have a device to manage your own fertility if you want to be safe and responsible. And my experience of challenging that and just seeing that there are other options and that they're not always talked about there there's a lot of myths surrounding fam and yeah I guess it just felt really important to be able to share that and connect with other people who also believe that as well and yeah I think it's important too to to really have openness to everybody's experiences and I always say that I'm not against the birth control pill but I'm also I'm I'm for people being informed um, about their options and when you're not told that you have other options or that you're not told about the side effects that might be subtle but that are often disregarded by our doctors, um, that feels really important to me and that people feel supported to make their own decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and it's just kind of evolved and, and as I go along, I learn more and more about uh, women's health and and hormonal health and I kind of just integrate that into what I do and to the clients that I work with and I think yeah I think what's happened is a lot of people find me because they have um, hormonal imbalances or they're struggling uh, to conceive or they have um, missing periods and I think it just goes to show that that this information needs to be um, more widely shared with people and people want to learn about their bodies (laughs) and about their cycles but they don't necessarily know where to go and I think sex ed has is kind of failed us in that way that we're not really taught about this information. Um, at least when I went to high school um, and a lot of people I know, um, it just kind of scratches the surface and then we kind of just figure things out as we go. Um, so this is kind of filling in that piece that that we didn't necessarily learn or that our, that our caregivers didn't know and weren't able to share with us. Well, that's exactly it. Mm-hmm. Right. If you if they weren't educated, then how can they teach us? And it's the same as the the health teacher. Um, I mean, again, I mean, look, a doctor might not even know about this. So why would they have have learned about it and then be able to in turn teach about it? And it is very much scratching the surface in in the school system. Um, do you think that this might somehow get into the school? Is this something this FEM kind of certification does? And how how huge is that? How big is this kind of organization? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I guess this organization is from the state. So they're, they're originally from New York. 
Um, and I think a lot of this information is more prominent in the States. And I think just there's a larger population. There's people who are searching for this information. And I think it's slowly kind of spreading to Canada and to other places as well. But there are, but it, but it is a fairly large organization. And what they do is they also teach doctors this information too, so that doctors are able to look at women's charts and identify and help treat hormonal imbalances. Um, there's also a branch of FEM that's a teen FEM branch, so you can learn to teach teenagers about their cycles, um, which is huge. And like we said before, a lot of what we can identify for teenagers can tell us ab- about their reproductive health long term. So it is definitely growing, and I think a big reason for that is women are looking for alternatives to hormonal birth control and with technology, with devices, with apps, it's it's gaining a little bit more ground, a little bit more traction, and um, it's definitely it's definitely growing. And I think when you mention fam, someone might might think it's the rhythm method, or like, oh, my grandma used that, or my mom used that. And I think it's kind of evolving from what our moms and our grandmas used, um, which was more like the calendar method or the rhythm method where you kind of estimate when you ovulated and you time your fertility around that. So with new devices and apps and technology, we're able to really um, reach more people and make it more accessible for sure. So yeah, I think it is growing and I think there is still a lot of misconceptions around it too. Um, and a lot of people who are wary about learning more about their bodies or healing their cycles or looking at what may, what might be going on for them uh, with their cycles. So, yeah. Yeah. I know you said you're, you have nothing against the pill or synthetic uh, uh, birth control. I do. <laughs> I do. I do only because uh, I remember I was at my, at a friend's house and her young daughter was thinking about going on this and it was just to regulate her periods and this pamphlet was sitting on the table and her brother just sat down and started looking at this thing right and he goes who is taking this right and he's like and then when they said you know the name and he was like well are you trying to kill her like really I mean I don't know if anybody ever really sits down and reads that pamphlet I think that's the other thing right we just don't take the time we don't want to we just again that quick fix it's like all right i'm just going to take we live in such a pill driven society that it is so easy to do that so i just save those always for the last resort because i do like the idea that there are options and there are safer options and i really truly believe that we are band-aiding some really potential health issues and uh, so i love this idea and had i not been now in menopause (laughs) i i might even have tried this one because i wish i had known about it actually um, when i started looking as well and i didn't know right? Because no one ever ever told me. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's wild. And yeah, I think it's funny. The the original trials for the birth control pill were like in the 1960s and we haven't really evolved from there. Like we still have the same um, ways of managing our fertility as we did back then. They're kind of like the same versions of what we had. There hasn't really been anything new. And I think, um, yeah, it's a real disservice to women because there's been trials for for male birth control that have shown similar side effects to what women experience and they've been kiboshed. Like they've just been really they've just been just ended. The trials have ended because men didn't want to deal with some of the side (laughs) effects that women experience right now with those devices and those those medications. Um, So, yeah, it's been said that the hormonal birth control pill is the only medication for people who aren't sick. It's something that we take every day that we don't really think of as as a medication, which it is. And it has side effects and it has serious side effects as well as just like really subtle ones that are sometimes not taken seriously, I think. Yeah. And women are just kind of told to deal with it, which is really sad. Absolutely. And then the potential long-term effects as well. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So yeah. And it's definitely... Yeah, it's definitely something that's becoming, I think, um, I think things are coming out more and we hear about more studies that are being done. But the issue is that you can't really do a long term study on a hormonal contraceptive because people will go off of it 
like they'll they'll try it for a little bit they'll go off of it they'll try it and they'll they'll want to go off to to conceive or they'll switch to a different method so there's not a lot of research out there that's long term that shows you know 20 years down the road what happens if you've been on this medication it's more anecdotally what we hear from other people Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. that's huge Mm -hmm. yeah Um, Uh, Well, I think uh, you're doing an amazing thing here. And I think that uh, many people will appreciate it. So how do they find you? So um, my business is Fertility Awareness Project, and I'm quite active on Instagram, so you can find me there. Okay. And yeah, this isn't your only job, right? You're, you're a social worker as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing, I am I work full time as a social worker in the mental health field. And then I also um, do the fertility awareness stuff on the side. But the two do actually kind of interestingly... Um, you know, crossover. Yes. And um, yeah, it's, it is a really interesting mix for sure. Yeah. 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 So you're on your Instagram. You have a website too, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fertilityawarenessproject.ca. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's lots of actually good information on there because uh, I took a, a, a gander through it and uh, yeah, you've you've got lots of stuff on there that you're just giving away for free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's really important to um, let people do their own research and have a place where they can trust to find information about this uh, because there is a lot of misinformation definitely with the media and um, certain articles online about fertility awareness. Um, so I really try to make the information accessible um, and offer a lot of articles and mini, mini audio lessons and stuff like that on my website as well. That's mm-hmm. lovely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in to talk. And stay tuned because I do think that this is something we further need to explore from different kind of perspectives too. And since I've been meeting, well, like I just, I've known Alison Ritchie for some time, but I love how all these people kind of come into my life at certain times. And I think there's a way that we should kind of bring everybody together here and kind of cover the whole kind of journey through uh, our cycles, being a woman, uh, what have you. I mean, I think there's lots. So stay tuned for that because uh, that's something we're going to work on as well. And uh, this I took off your website, Natalie, here, but where it says fertility is not just about making babies. It's about your health. So I like that a lot. And I hope you take that to heart as well. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. It's really it's really great to chat. And I think it is exciting how um, you're connecting so many people in this community who um, are doing really amazing things. So yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Until next time, everybody. uh, Keep being a wildflower. 